I, I would like for us to um, to contemplate some things. Uh, whoo, I forgot about um, something else. All right, let me do that now. Um, I, I'd like to share a song with you and, and hope that you're blessed by this song. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry about that. Yes, no, 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 brother Matt. I didn't write that. Um, but it's a song I heard, and was, I was moved by the message, and so I thought we should uh, we should learn it and, and and perform it because I think the message is true, and I hope that we will get to that um, that understanding um, where we we see the reality that we we all confess. Okay, um, I will. Okay, today let me get to today. I want to um, to continue with this um, idea of equipping the saints about faith. And um, what I want you to think about is, well, let me think about this. Um, I, you know what I realized? I realized that the church generally, a church body, I mean, I, I heard Daniel giving the, the examples of these pastors and the things that they're doing in the church and why people seem to obey. Um, I think I, I, I heard somebody talking about this recently and um, they were saying, 
that there are two things that are used to control the church, to control the people in the church. The first one is fear. And the next one is guilt. Isn't that interesting? Fear and guilt controls the body. So fear that this person who is before you, who is your minister, who, you, who has lordship over you, because that's what they, they believe, um, that if you don't agree and follow and obey, that you're in trouble. And, and if you don't do and follow and obey, you're guilty. See the point? So I think this is something, but, but I hope that we're neither in, 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 none of us is in any of this, um, this category where fear controls us or guilt controls us. Because guess what? Christ has taken away guilt and Christ has taken away fear. So any man who's in Christ Jesus, they are not fearful and they are not guilty. They don't, they don't suffer from these, um, these, these, these characteristics, okay? I'm hoping so, because this is the truth of the word of God. Anyway, what I'd like to do is I'd, I'd like to think about more the application of something we talked about last week, which is weapons of our warfare. Um, we talked about those weapons and we found out that the weapons that are given to us today were actually the same weapons that Jesus had while he was here on earth. And that those weapons, the weapons of Jesus was what? Do you remember? His words. Amazing. His words. So what we want to look at a little bit today is really the application of this. Um, the application of, of how we're using our words. Because guess what? All of us have been given the same weapons. And Paul says that we, even though we are flesh, even though we are human beings, our weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, they are not carnal. And he says that these weapons are mighty through God. Have we actually discovered this? That we as, as Christians, I mean, first, I guess the first dilemma is does Christians have weapons? Of course, we carry weapons. They are not swords and shields and guns. And and and, um, and and germs and biological warfare uh, uh, weapons. No, the weapons that we carry is more than that. It's more effective. In fact, the word says it is mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So um, let's think about some things um, as we um, as we as we continue today. Are we using our words then? And um, this is the question for all of us. Are we using our words for? Um, to destroy our enemies all over us and our children? Are we using our words to do that? Or um, are we using our words to release the captives from the bondage and from the prison that they have been held in? Or are we using our words to backbite and criticize and to tear down others? Because, you know, that's the truth. We, we, we use our words carelessly and no one that Jesus said be careful what you say, because he said, by your words, you shall be justified. What does that mean? Or by your words, you shall be condemned. Isn't that what he says? This is Matthew chapter 12. So I think it is important that we understand what we're doing, what we're saying um, most of the time, because words are very, very powerful. Words are very, very powerful. And because of this, um, because we have not known um, the proper, uh, or, or because we have not known the power of words, and we don't realize how much words mean and how much we speak into existence just by the things that we say, we use them carelessly. Or we use, you know, we talk, we have this negative thing, this negative talk. I was, talk, um, I was talking on Wednesday night about a family member who, um, who, who is, or I, I normally would say that, that this person is pessimistic, right? And, and the person says, no, 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 somebody has to talk about the negative and I just, I, I happen to be that one. Now, I want you to think about that because here's a good rule of thumb. If you, if you don't have something positive to say to change the situation, don't speak. Be quiet. If you don't have something positive to say to change the situation, in fact, uh, some, some, some weeks and months or, or so ago, maybe a year or more, I spoke about the perspective of the priesthood. Um, and what the priests were supposed to do. And, 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 I, and I said this was, was compliment of um, um, Daddy Clayton, who shared a little bit with us about the idea of what a priest is supposed to, to do. Because here we're reading in the book of Revelation. And Revelation is saying that we were made unto God to be kings and priests unto him. So I'm thinking, if the priesthood is passed away and, and, and the Old Testament is done away with and the New Testament, how would, how would, what is Jesus saying that we have been made to be kings and priests unto God? 
Because see, my, my conception, and I think most of us, the conception that we have is that a priest, the work of a priest is to mediate, is to be the mediator between God and sinners. But there's another work of the priest that not, not many people are familiar with and, and is not talked about so much. And the work of the priest really is, one of the role of the priest is that of bringing good news. And I could give you a story um, to back it up, but I just want you to think about that. So if, if you're a priest of God, if you are a child of God, then our mission should be to bring good news to the world and not, not to feast so much on the negative, but to show the good news about what God has done. So I want you, to, I want you first of all to examine the problems that you're in. Examine the problems that you're facing, the problems that are in your life, the things that are stressing you out and causing all of this. Examine the problems and I want to ask you to think, think about this. What are you using as a solution to your problem? What is it that you're using as a solution to your problem? Are you using the weapons that you have been given? Are you using the weapons that Jesus gave you, these, these weapons of warfare? And if not, is it any wonder why things are the way they are? Is it any wonder that we're not seeing victory? Um, something happened Something happened to me between last night and this morning, early. Um, and um, it, it kind of helped me, what, what, what happened kind of helped me to, to, it gave me an answer to, to a, a question that has been asked me many times, and I never had a good answer um, um, for this, right? So, so when this happened, in fact, Sister Diane, I hope this helps. I hope this really gives an answer to, to some of the, the issues that we have talked about. But um, I was talking, before I went to bed, I, I was talking to my wife, and I was talking to her about um, how amazing it was that, that I've been healed. Since she prayed for my back, since she prayed for me, I've had nothing, no pain, no issues. And so we were talking about this and we were just rejoicing together about the goodness of God and how much he has given us power over all the works of the enemy. So, so we were just rejoicing and then I went off to bed. I went um, off early. And so um, I got up somewhere, I would think, I would be thinking maybe around midnight. I got up to go to the bathroom. And the moment I, I got and turned to come off the bed, I felt a sharp pain eat right across my back. And immediately, I knew what was happening. Immediately, I, it's like I saw the spiritual realm, and I, and I attacked it, and I spoke out, and I said, Satan, you're a liar. I am healed. And that's what God says. That's the promise he gave to me. You are a liar. I went, I did what I had to do. I went back to bed. I, I didn't even think about it. I slept like a baby. And I got up this morning, and I came off the bed, without any pain or discomfort. Now, this, I, I mean, it, it, when I got up, I, the thing just came to me. It's like a revelation that says, that is why people lose their healing. And we have talked about this. I've, I've, we've talked, I've talked um, to many people about these, these different things because I know of people who have been healed. They have been healed. The evidence was there. The pain went, the discomfort went. They were healed. And after a while, it just seemed like the healing um, was lost. It just, the, the, the same issues came back. And when they came back, what happened? It leads us to do certain things. We say, maybe, you know, uh, maybe I wasn't healed. I'm telling you something. You see, when that comes back, what you do at that moment is very, very critical. When, when that pain comes back, when something happens to you um, that, that, that you know you've been healed from, what you do at that moment is very, very critical. And, um, and I, I, look, if you don't know what to do, I can understand. But I believe a lot of people, if, if we accept that this coming back um, is of is, is what i don't know if we accept this without raising a standard against that standing up and declaring certain things because look we're talking about this idea of what we're saying right that's what we're dealing with the weapons of our warfare and um, that song says what do you confess you possess so I'm, I'm 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 showing you don't take don't think i'm going pentecostal if you have that thought you hold on i'm going to the word of god and we're going to show you from the word this morning what the word of god yes what, what the word of god says about what i am saying Right? Because I'm simply coming to you from what the Word of God says. I'm just talking a little bit before we get, get into the Word. So I'm just saying, what, depending on what your views are and your understanding are, once that thing starts coming back, it is for you to stand up and say, No, you don't come back. You, you're a, you go. 
you it's for you to stand up and take stand in your your authority that you have been given by Jesus Christ. Now I, you know what I remember um, I remember Brother Justin I remember Brother Justin um, sharing an experience um, of being challenged with with, with with something that the doctors call an incurable disease and his approach in trusting God um, and in trusting God's word over the, over, over over these. Um, over the, the words of those who knows nothing else but that of the physical. And, and so here, Justin is seeing some great results. Um, and I hope Justin doesn't mind me sharing. Well, I, I think he did, did talk about this publicly as well. Um, but he was seeing some great results and then having some symptoms return in his body. Now, the, he was at work. And I'm talking a little too loud now. Yeah. He was at work. It was winter. It was cold outside, it was snowing, it was winter, he was at work, and guess what? These symptoms came back in his body. He said he just opened the door and he went out in the cold and he started just speaking and just declaring certain things over him. And he said, look, those symptoms disappeared. Okay, those symptoms disappeared. I'm telling you what I'm seeing, what I'm seeing, those symptoms have to obey. What I'm seeing is that because we have not, we have not been taught properly. We have been, not been taught the Bible. We have not been taught the realities that we, uh, we have in Christ Jesus. We have not been, been taught who we are and what we possess. We have not been taught that he lives inside of us and that he is married to our spirits and that we are perfected there because we've not been taught that. We don't live in that realm. We don't live in that realm of authority. We don't live in that realm where we command and see it happen. In fact, here's something I want us to do today. I want us to... Um, uh, I, I'm going to. I'm, I'm going to be going to. We have, we have. There's a problem with that little word. Ask. A S K. The word ask. I want us to to look at that word because, and in fact, I want to spend a little time just looking at the word ask because I think there are some misunderstandings as it relates to this word, and I want to examine the idea between behind the word ask. Okay. Um. And and why am I why, why am I doing this? Because there are many passages that I, I want to look at. So um, nothing is left untouched. I, I mean, there, there are passages that gives wrong implications, and I want to do that. I want to do that um, now. So let me let me go to let me go to the to the Bible. Um, I, I have to do something different here. Hold on, just just a moment. Let me get this thing sorted. Uh, okay. All right. So I, I'm I'm going to start with the Book of Matthew. I'm going to look um, here in the book of Matthew. I'm going to look at a couple of verses here, starting in chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7. And these are verses that you're familiar with. The first one is Matthew 7, 7. And here's what it says. Ask. I mean, interesting. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone, verse 8, for everyone that... Ask it, receive it, and he that seek it, find it, and, and to him that knock it, it shall be open. All right, so Matthew, Matthew 7 here seems to be telling us that what we need to do is ask. Now, so what does that mean, ask? You keep that, you keep that question in mind as we go to the next um, passage here in Matthew, and is chapter 18 of Matthew, and I'm going to read one verse that you've probably heard, heard me quote before or talked about before. It's verse 19. Again, I say unto you, Jesus speaking. In fact, notice something. I'm using all red letter editions. Um, the, all the red letters that I'm using are the words of Jesus. And so I'm using the words of Jesus to show you certain things that I, I want to bring to your attention. So here Jesus saying, again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree touching anything that they shall ask, if two of you shall agree um, on earth touching anything that you shall want, beloved, what's the word? Ask. It shall be done for them of my Father, which is in heaven. And uh, one more passage in Matthew is a familiar one in chapter 21. And let's go down to verse 22. Here's what Jesus says here in verse 22. And all things, whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. Now, there's a definite reason why, why I'm doing this, and um, and you will see it in just in just a moment. Um, John, I'm going to go over to the book of John. I'm going to start in chapter 14 of John. And in chapter 14 of John, Jesus left some very interesting instructions. And here's what he says in verse 13. 
and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Again, whatsoever you shall do, what beloved? Ask. Again, verse 14. The next verse says, And if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. That's, a, that's that, those, those verses are just, they are, they are strong. And um, I believe that we ought to, um, to take some notes here as to what we're building up to see. Verse 7 of chapter 15 says something else. Abide in me. And my words, if sorry, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall do what now? You shall ask what you will. And what will be the result? And it shall be done unto you. These are the words of Jesus. And, 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 and as I said, the evidence is there from what we've been looking at. The last um, passage is chapter 16 and um, verses, a couple of verses here. Verse 16 says, 16, verse 23 says, And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Almost um, doubling up um, in the amount of two weakness here, what he said in verse in chapter 14. Hitherto, or before this, have you asked nothing in my name? Ask, and you shall receive that your joy might, may be full. Now, I have a question for you as it relates to, um, to this idea of asking, because I'm sure all of us on this platform have been at that place where we have asked. Now, what, what is it, what is it, or what, sorry, what does it mean to ask? What is the meaning of this word? All of those examples that we've looked at, the word used there, um, it, the, the original meaning of the word used is to ask, to beg, to call for, to crave, to desire, or require. That's what the word means. You can check this out on your own as well. Now, I, I will look at the practical example, and, and then I'm going to do something um, else. In fact, let me go back here. Let me go back here and show you something in this. this um, in, let's go back to Matthew. I'm going to show you something in, in, in Matthew. Um, chapter 14, you may have missed this, and um, I, let me just go to Matthew, Matthew chapter 14. I want, you, I want to bring you a story that you're familiar with. The, the story is when um, Herod um, had a party, do you remember, before his birthday. In fact, look at what he says in verse 6. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias, which was um, Philip's wife, remember John the Baptist had an issue with Herod taking his daughter's wife, and so the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Okay, look at what happens next. Verse 7, whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would. The word is ask. Verse 8 says, and she, being, being before instructed of her mother, said, Give me here John Baptist's head in a charger. If this is true, that the, the meaning of the word ask is how we have understood ask, to, to simply mean um, to make a requirement or make a request, and most times with, with the word please at the end. If this is true, did she ask for John the Baptist's head or did she demand John the Baptist's head? Think about that. Did she demand this? Or did she ask? Because if it was just a question, could not Herod say no? But Herod said, anything that you demand, anything that you, the word, I'm, I want you to see this, anything that you demand, it will be given you. And the next verse says, the king was sorry. Look at, that, look at this, the king was sorry. Nevertheless, for the old say, and for them that sat with him at meat, he commanded that it be given her, and they went and killed John the Baptist. Now, I want you to keep that in mind, that there may be a different, when you look at the word of God, there may be a difference with the word ask than you and I are familiar with. And for that reason, what I want to do, I want to go to something now that I, I am going to call circumstantial evidence. And I want you to listen, hear me out, hear me out, um, before you, you condemn the things that I'm saying. Hear me out. Um, I, I looked at this word, this, this idea of the circumstantial evidence, and you know what it says? It says that circumstantial evidence is an evidence that tends to prove a fact 
by proving other events or circumstances which affords a basis for a, re um, for a reasonable inference of the occurrence of the fact at issue. Okay, think about that. I want to use something that I, I call, I'm going to call circumstantial evidence. I'm going to tell you why. Because when Jesus said all of these things that we just read, when he said everything that we just read, he was speaking directly to the apostles, to the disciples. They all heard him. They, they heard what he said because he spoke to them directly. Um, and they understood him because they spent more time with him. They were three years, three and a half years with him. And so they understood everything that he was saying. Now, what I want you to do um, is I want you to see how the disciples prayed after Jesus left. Is that reasonable? Because if once we can do this, it does make sense that we can understand from what they did that the, circumstance, the circumstantial evidence proved differently than we understand. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew 28 and verse 18 says that we should go baptize in the name of the Father, verse 19, and the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that true? We don't baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit anymore. We baptize in the name of Jesus. Why? When you look at the circumstantial evidence of the same people who were commanded by Christ to go and baptize, how did they baptize? When you go to the book of Acts, when you take the New Testament and you look at, what, at how they reacted to what Jesus said, why did, they, uh, why did they go and baptize in the name of Jesus? There's a reason, right? So maybe, I'm just saying, from that circumstantial evidence, maybe the understanding that we're having of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we're thinking it's the triune name and all of that, maybe that was not implied at all. But the people who understood best, you look at how they did it, and you recognize that there's a different understanding that we have today, that, um, that, that we have today than they had back then. So that's kind of the circumstantial evidence I want you to look at. So I want you to look at these. The, well, I went through the book of Acts and I, I found maybe about 18, I think, different places where miracles were, were performed and all of that. And I want you to see, and, if, and in fact, if you're able, please write these verses down. And I want you to do this on your own. Be like the Bereans. Don't take my words for it. You go to the word of God. You look at the word of God and prove me wrong. Show me that the things that I'm saying are not true because I'm coming to you from the word of God. I'm just showing you what Jesus said and that we're, we're, ex we're, we're exploring what Jesus said and making sure that what he said, we are in, um, in agreement and we are, as Daniel said this morning, we are obeying what he said, right? Because that's the work that we're supposed to do. Obey. Isn't that the work? That's what he said. All right, so let's look at the book of Acts. I'm going to look at miracles of the book of Acts and I'm going to start with the first one. The first one... Um, uh, the first miracle in the book of Acts happened in chapter 3. Okay, well, you would say chapter 1 where he was taken up and all of that, or the Spirit came down. But I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking now where they went to do. The first miracle in the book of Acts was that Peter and John were going to pray. This is Acts chapter 3. You can read the story, write this down. Acts 3, 1 to, 8, 1 to 11, I think somebody tells you that the story. And there was a man sitting at the gate, beautiful, at the gate of Jerusalem, and he was asking for arms. He was asking for help. He was begging for money. And what did Peter and John do? Here was a man that was crippled. Here was a man who, was, who, was, who, who needs help, not just money. He needed healing. And Peter and John said to him, we don't have money. Now, let me ask you. Let me ask you to be honest in your assessment. They said, we don't have money. But what we have, we will give you. So they had something to give him and they gave him. Now, I want you to see how they asked, how they gave him what they had. Did they ask God to give him what they have? Compare all that you've ever seen. A person here is in need of help. What do we do? A person online is, need of, is in need of help. A person is sick and, and suffering. How, what do we do? Look at what Peter and John did. We don't have money, but we have, what we have we give you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. What they had was the weapons, and they used the weapon to destroy the enemies um, holding this man's life. And the man got up and leapt for joy. That's the first one. The next one is Ananias and Sapphira. Remember in chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira were struck dead. What did Peter do? Did, did Peter pray and ask God to strike them? 
you look at that story, it's chapter 5 and verses 1 to 10. You, you, you decide whether or not they did what they did because Jesus said, if you ask, look at how they ask and understand what that ask means. Chapter 5 also talks about some miracles, a lot of miracles that were done there. In fact, you know, the people brought many people to the streets and they said, look, just 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 stand just lay your your coat just lay what and if the, and by the, sh the shadow of peter passing you can't see my shadows on this side but by the shadow of peter passing you those people were healed it's chapter five that talked about even people using handkerchiefs on the body of paul and taking down his aprons in the workshop when he went when he went home and went and healed people and cast out them with a piece of cloth from his body this sounds pentecostal but it's bible and I'll tell you why it sounds Pentecostal, because the Pentecostal church has taken the reality and has gone after it, right? And we're standing in the background and saying, no, I, I, I'm not going there, right? So that's we're afraid to talk about these things, but they are in the word of God and we're talking about what is in the word. So um, Peter and John went down in chapter 8 and they went, that's after Philip went there and they went down, they were baptized these people and we're probably going to look at this sometime in the future. The baptism of John versus the baptism of Jesus, right? We're going to look at this baptism of the Holy Spirit um, eventually. But they went down um, and prayed for them that they may receive the Holy Spirit. That's what it says in chapter 8. But what did they do? What did they do? And I, I want you to see that we have a wrong conception because we're trying to put our, our, our understanding on what the, word, what the word says without looking at the evidences to see if that's really what it says. They went and all of these men were filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what it says in chapter 8. Um, in chapter 9, Peter um, went down to Lydda and there was a man that was paralyzed. His name was Aeneas. And look at how Peter healed that man. What did Peter do? He asked God, how did he do it? I want you to think about that. They called Peter from, from, from Lydda over to the, the next city for Dorcas that was dead, that, that, that was giving out all of these things. And Peter, um, Peter went to raise her. And isn't it true that what Peter did was far different from, from anything I did or anybody else that went to raise the dead? They know Peter called her back to life. He used the weapons that he had to even destroy dead. Um, chapter 12, they were in, in prison. Um, and an angel came and released him from prison. Um, chapter 12 um, also talks about um, God smiting Herod and he died at Jerusalem. Um, Elimas the sorcerer in chapter 13 um, was smitten with blindness. Remember? How were these things done? Paul was converted on the road to, that, to, 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 um, to Saul, was converted on the road to Damascus. And um, I'm just talking about these miracles. And, and Paul healed this, this, this crippled man at Lystra. And it's interesting what it says, that there was this man that was impotent in his feet. That's what the word says. And, he, and Paul looked at him and saw that he had faith to be healed. You tell me how that happens. He looked at him, he saw that he had faith to be healed. And he said, Aeneas, whatever this man was, name was, he said, stand upon your feet. And the man stood up and he asked God, didn't he? How was he healed? Of course, it was God who healed, right? But how? All right. And Paul, um, in chapter 16, with that girl that was falling after them and said, listen to these men, they're men of God. Paul cast out that spirit of divination um, in Philippi. And um, let, let's go down a little bit too. Paul um, restores Eutychus to life. You remember when he fell out of the window? How did, how did he do that? Did he go and say, Lord God, do you know this is for your glory and the people are going to disrespect what I said except you bring him back? No, no, no. You read what Paul did and you'll see how Eutychus came back to life. You look look at, at what happened when Paul healed the father of Publius in chapter 28 and you'll see that all of these things that they did were far different than how we do it. And yet they all asked. But how did they ask? What did they do? What's the understanding of asking? And, um, and, and I, I mean, I'm just saying to you that the evidence, when you look at the word of God, the evidence in, book, in, the, in the New Testament is strong that they don't pray like you and I pray. They don't pray asking God and God, I'm asking you to heal. No, in fact, Jesus made it clear in, in, in Mark 11. And you're familiar with Mark 11. In fact, let me just do a quick comparison here. Mark 11, you're, you know what, what it says there in verse... Um, in verse 23, uh, remember in a song that we shared, Mark 11, 23, it is real to me. Mark 11, 23, I want you to look at something here. Um, 
And, and, and tell me, why does Jesus do this, right? Because Jesus said something, which I think, I think um, here it's important that you get the idea that he was trying to bring across. For verily I say unto you in verse 23, that, what, that whosoever shall say, you tell me what, is, what, that, what that means. Whosoever shall say to this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe that the things that he said shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. You tell me what that means. You tell, and he's saying, the verse before he says, have faith in God. The margin says, or the other translation says, have the faith of God. How does the faith of God work? The faith of God works by declaring and, 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 and proclaiming and saying, commanding even. You say what you need to see happen and it will happen. Is that what the word of God says? You just read it. Jesus said, say to the mountain. If you shall say, be moved. But what do we do when, the, when we are faced with the mountains? What do, what do we do when the mountains are before us? What do we do? We say, God, God, move this mountain, please, God. I can't mind. And we cry out to God. And when God says, say, we get offended and we get discouraged and we go and we and we go in a corner by ourselves because I don't know why God didn't answer me because um, I mean he's my he's my father I'm not, am I not his son? Look at what God says. You, he is in you. He is in you, and he says, "You speak and release what is in you." He said, "Say this to the mountain." In fact, look at the next verse. The next verse is very similar to what we read in Matthew earlier. Look at what it says here. Therefore, I say unto you, in light of this. I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Let's let's do something. Let's go back to Matthew and look and look at Matthew chapter 21 and verse 22 and see if you're getting the picture. Look at what it says here in verse 22. This is Matthew's version, but I'm, I want you to see what it says. Look, he says, and all things. It's the same story. It's the same um, fig tree issue. He says, and, 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 and all things whatsoever you shall, what now? Ask in prayer. Believe that you receive, believe, believing you shall receive. It's the same story. Look at John's version. John's version brings, brings, brings this out even, come on. John's version, version brings this out even clearer. Where John said in, in verse 24 of, of, of not John. Not John, John, not John, Mark. Mark says in verse 24 of, 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 of chapter 11, the same thing we just read from Matthew. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Why are we having? One, we're not declaring. Two, we're not believing. Because if you don't believe, will you have? What have we been doing? We've been saying, God, please do this for me. And when God, when it, when it seems like it's not done, we say, um, I don't know, something is wrong. Something is wrong with my faith, and I don't understand why these things are going. Because we understand the word ask to mean to call, to call on for an answer. So we, we understand the word ask to mean, um, or to put the question about, um, or to make a request, right? And, uh, and um, I, I would like to say that is really... The problem I see, the problem that I see in us not seeing and, and receiving that which we are praying for. I'm going to wrap it up with, a, with, a, with an example. I'm going to wrap it up with an example, and I hope that um, this will make it even clearer. I'm going to go to the book of, 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 of James, and I'm going to show you something from the book of James as it relates to, you know, James is the one who talks about um, that, that we should we should, is any sick among you? Have you read that one before? He says, is any, is any sick among you? Look at what he says. He says, call for the elders, let them anoint and pray. And he says, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Now, who does the raising up? Who does the raising up? According to James, he says, and the Lord shall raise him up. Isn't that what he says? So, so look at this. this. This James chapter 5, look at this, what it says here. James 5, it says, verse 6, 14. Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders and let them pray over him, anointing with oil in the name of the Lord. And what it says next, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. 
And if he had committed any sins, he shall be forgiven him. So sometimes we are afraid to touch that part, but it's right there. He says, if he has committed any sin, the moment that he that that he is saved, the same power that saves him, James says, his sins are forgiven. The same power cleanses him from sin. Okay, so if you're dealing with a sinner, then just understand that he's healed. Let him know you're also forgiven. And you can lead that person to Christ right there and then because he's made clean right before you. Right? That's what the word says. Now, let's look at the next verse because um, some, somehow, sometimes, because of heritage, you know how we inherited all of these different, we, we don't approach the word of God from the perspective of, of seeing the word for what it says and what it means. We approach it from our preconceived ideas and what we were taught that this means, which is not a good uh, principle. Okay? Look at this verse. Confess your faults one to another. This says in verse 16 of James 5. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now, it is true that James is not necessarily talking about healing physically, healing from a sickness or a malady uh, or a disease. He's simply talking about when there is a rift between two individuals, when we, when we have an animosity where we are separated because of something that somebody did to hurt. He said, confess your faults one to another. In other words, apologize. Let the, pe let the person know I did wrong, whatever. And he says, and pray for one another that, that this rift may be healed, that this, 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 your communication, your, your um, fellowship might be restored. That's, really, that's mainly what he's talking about here. But look at what he says next. He says something here in the in the end part. He says, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And I want you to keep that in mind. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And then what he did is very interesting. Then he goes on to show you what a righteous, who a righteous man is, and and how his prayers are effectual. How his prayers that, that, um, that are fervently prayed are effectual. And look at what he says in verse 17. Verse 17 says, Elias, speaking of Elijah, Elias was a man, look at what he says here, very interesting. Come on. Elias was a man subject to like passions um, as we are, he was human being, flesh and blood, just like you and I. He said, so Elijah was no different from you and I. He was just a flesh and blood man like you and I. And look at what he said. And he prayed, yeah, and, and James adds something here. And he prayed, how now? He prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on earth by the space of three years and six months. And look at what he says next in verse 18. And he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain, and the earth bring forth her fruit, brought forth her fruit. Very interesting, very interesting, and I believe God gave this, this 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 story for a specific reason. That's what I want us to look at. I want us to look at the story of Elijah. I want us to go back to the Old Testament. We're going to examine the story of Elijah, and I want you to see what James says. And you tell me when we look at what James says, and we look at the story. You tell me if you come to the same conclusion. All right, let's go to First Kings. First Kings. The story is in First Kings, and I'm going to just take verse chapter 17 and start in verse one. Elijah, Elijah. Is an enigma. Um, Elijah, Elijah appeared on the scene just here. It's the first mention of his name in the Old Testament. There was no line, there's nothing of Elijah. We heard simply that Elijah the Tishbite. So we heard he was from this tribe, right? And that's all. Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab. All right, so this is what we, we this is what we hear. Elijah the Tishbite. Um, uh, who was of the inhabitants of, of Gilead, came to the king of Israel, Ahab, and look at what he says. As the word, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, listen to what he said, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. This is the story. James is referring to the same story. Now, James said he prayed earnestly. Wow. Did you see a prayer here? Of course. What was the prayer? He came and he released from his mouth. He spoke to him and he said, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And he left the palace. He left the palace and something started happening. And I want you to see, because if you don't look at this, you're going to miss it. 
So when he left the palace, something happened, and he said, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, and the word of the Lord turned him and told him where to go. Go to go to the um, to the, the brook chariot, and you stay there until I give you more word. Okay. And um, and the word of the Lord came again in verse eight. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise and go to Zarephath. I want you to think because the, the, the issue is we missed that in the first instant. The first instant was the word of the Lord came to Elijah. That's the only reason why he went to Ahab. The word of the Lord came to him and he went and said what the word of the Lord said. Are you disbelieving me? You will see. Just let's go on because something happened. So the word of the Lord sends him to the brook chariot. The word of the Lord takes him from the brook chariot, sends him to Jarifa to stay with her widow and her son. Do you remember the story? But it's the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord is what was directing him. Let's go to the next chapter. Because the next chapter, I'm going to cut the story short. But I want you to read this on your own at home. Because you must investigate to see if what I have said is the truth or not. Look at verse 1. This is chapter 18. Look at what it says here. And it came to pass after many days, of course, many days, three years and six months, that the word of the Lord, look at this again, that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year. What does the word of the Lord say? Go, show yourself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Who said they were going to send rain upon the earth? It was the word of the Lord. God said he would send rain upon the earth. So Elijah said, look, what did he tell Ahab in the beginning? He says, there shall be no wind, no, no dew, no rain, but according to what? My word. Whose word was his word? His word was the word of God. When the word comes to him, he uses the same word that is in him and release that word. And he says, my word. That's it. Look, I don't have time to, to, to talk about this, this message. I'm telling you. Look, he goes to Ahab. He gets the word from God. He goes to Ahab and he, he, he arranges for Ahab to meet at Mount Carmel. Okay? So, so they, they made all of this, but it all came because the word of the Lord came to him. So they went to Carmel and, 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 and Carmel, all of what happened in Carmel took place. You know that. And eventually all of these, these um, 850 prophets were killed, right? It was 400 prophets of Baal, 450 prophets of the growth. You read the chapter, I'm telling you. They were all killed and something happened here um, that when they were all killed, that um, verse 42 no uh, let, me, let, me, let me get this, this correct all right. Look at verse 41. This is at the end. Verse 40 says, And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the book chariot and slew them there. Okay? So this is the end of Carmel's um, experience. And Elijah said, verse 41, Elijah said to Ahab, You get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Let me ask you a question. Who heard the rain? Who heard the rain? He tells Ahab, There's a sound of abundance of rain. Look at what Ahab did. Ahab went up, so Ahab went up to eat and to drink. But Elijah told him there's rain coming. He said, there is a sound of abundance of rain. And when Ahab went to eat and drink, I want to show you what Elijah did. And Elijah went up to the top of Carmel and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. Elijah just said that there's a sound of abundance of rain. He just told Ahab this, that there's a sound of abundance of rain. Now he goes on the top of Carmel and he puts himself down between his two knees. And he said something to his servant. Look at what he said. And he said to his servant, go, go up now and look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. What is he doing? What is Elijah doing? You see, I'm trying to show you what James just said. And you, if you just take that without looking at the story, you miss the whole point. And he sent him seven times again. And go again seven times. I'll tell you what happened. God told Elijah that he will send rain. Elijah's word is based on God's word. Elijah went and he told Ahab, this is what will happen. Let's go to Carmel. Then Elijah said, I hear the sound of abundance of rain. He probably was the only person hearing that. And he must have been hearing that in the spirit because nobody else around him heard. Then Elijah went to Carmel on the top of the mountain and he stayed there. He says, you go and look and tell me what you see. 
The servant says, I see nothing. He said, go back. I see nothing. Go back. Nothing. And he would have gone a hundred times if it was necessary. Because God said he was going to send rain. And he said, I'm not stopping until you tell me what you see. And he said, okay, I see a cloud. And it came to pass on the seventh time he ever fall for. He said, behold, there arises a cloud out of the sky, out of the sea, like a man's hand. And guess what? He said, go up, say unto Ahab, prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. What's my point? What's my point? I want you to see. I'm just simply saying to you, we take the word of God. We read the word of God. We misunderstand the word of God and misinterpret the word of God. And when it doesn't happen like we understand it, we get discouraged. But I'm telling you, the word of God, there is a necessity for us to understand this idea of the weapons that we've been given. If you don't know your weapon, why are you going to even put on your armor? If you don't know your weapon, because you're, it's not to put on your armor, it's to have your weapon. The armor and the weapon works hand in hand. We're going to be talking some more about the gifts of the Spirit. And, all of, and if you don't understand how to use them, if you don't understand how these gifts operate, look, the first gift of the Spirit is the word of knowledge. Where does that manifest itself? The word of knowledge comes through your mouth. The word, next one is the word of wisdom. It comes through your mouth. I'm simply saying, when you think about everything that the word of God says, the weapon of the Christian is right here, is what he says. I'm sorry, that's a strong one, but it's the truth. You examine it and you see. Now, so, so let's look at what, what James said. James said, Look here, Elijah was just like you, a man of like passion, just like you. What did Elijah do? He prayed earnestly. You just saw what earnest praying meant. He heard from God and said what God said. That's what earnest prayer meant. Because you didn't see Elijah fasting and praying, I'm going to go to Ahab. And when I speak, I hope that my words will have effect. No, the word came to Elijah and he went to Ahab and he said, look here. No rain, no dew, no rain, but according to my word. Where did he get that from? Of course, it was the word of God that came to him. My question then is, what is the word of God to you? What is the word of God that is coming to you today? What is that word of God saying to you? That's my point. I want you to understand that this is the issue. And I think if we fail to see it, brothers and sisters, we're just going to be going around in a circle. We're just because we don't understand our authority. The disciples understood who they were. They understood clearly who they were. They understood what they had. Peter and John knew. They said, we don't have money, but what we have, we will give you. And they did. Is Peter and John different than from you and, you and I? Are they different from us? I'm going to read you a verse. This verse is in, uh, is in Peter. It's awesome when you look at the word of God. Oh God, why, why, why is it that the, the enemy has so, has so messed up the world and messed up Christianity that we don't see from the word anymore? We see from what people say. We see from writings in books. We, and we don't see what the word of God is saying. We don't see it because we were trained not to see. We were trained to listen and be instructed instead of seeing what the word of God says. Look, here's Peter speaking in chapter 4 of 1 Peter and verse 11. You tell me, what is he saying here? If any man speak, he says, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as, the, um, as of the ability which God gave it that God in all things might be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. If any man speak, he said, you should speak as the oracle of God. The only way you can be the oracle of God if, is, is if you know you're the temple of God and you're listening to God constantly and always, and you know your reality, you know what you've been given, and you know that nothing, in fact, let me go to that verse, one of my favorite verse, verses in Matthew chapter 17, and he says it here in verse 20. Matthew 17 and verse 20. He says it, he says it this way. He says, Jesus said, the answer to their problem, their question was really, why couldn't we cast out this demon, demon from this little boy? And he told them the reason. The reason was your unbelief. The reason was not the boys. It wasn't the fathers. It was your unbelief. The disciples who went to pray, they were unbelievers. They, at that moment, something happened to their faith and they weren't believing. Look at what he said. For very, very, I said to you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall, what is the word, beloved? 
say unto the mountain. This is another place. You know, in in in, um, in 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 Mark, we just read that earlier, where he said in, in chapter eleven that if you say, look what Jesus said. He says, if you say unto the mountain, remove hence to yonder place, what will happen? It shall remove. That's what the word says. And then here is the favorite part. Here's my favorite part of the whole verse. And nothing, this is Jesus speaking, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Nothing. It's Jesus that said it. Why are things impossible unto us? We are not believing. We don't have faith. And because we don't believe the word of God, we don't take the word of God, and we don't, we don't live by the word of God, and, we, and let the word of God flow out of us like the very oracles of God, we don't see results. And we get discouraged. But I'm here to encourage you. I'm here to equip you to understand that what God is saying, you look at my word. My word never fails. You look at what the word of God says. Look at what the word of God tells you. And then you can understand much better now that the issue of asking has to do with more commanding or speaking into existence. Now you understand that what he was simply saying is that you have the authority inside of you. Why? Because he is in you. Jesus is there. The Father is there. Why are we seeking for him outside when he's there? We're calling him down. Oh God, where is he? He's someplace up there. They told us he's someplace up there in the most holy place and so on. No, 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 beloved. He's in you. He's right here. He's in you and he's in me. He's right here. I haven't thought this interesting that, you know, we bow our heads to pray. It's almost like you're, you're talking to him, you know, you bow your heads and, and, and I'm telling you, this is kind of the perspective. And I want you to see this because the lesson is important for us to grasp that the way, the, the only reason why we, we don't see the things that we ought to be seeing is because we're not believing like we ought to be believing. All right, so here's the next question. Brother Howard, how then do we get answers? Sometimes we get answers, and we get answers by asking, as the way we understand. But I'm telling you, what happens then is because you're, of what you're believing. See, your, your answer comes because of Jesus said that if you believe it and don't doubt it, you will receive it, right? Sometimes it's just what you're believing in your heart. Look here, I'm telling you this. I have seen answers to prayer that I never prayed, meaning I never spoke. But there, was, there were sometimes questions in my mind, and God gives me answers. Brother Howard. So, just, 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 uh, uh, sorry. Who was that, just? Yeah, it's Brother Reggie. Uh, I wanted to um, answer that, I wanted to answer that rhetorical question that you were asked, that you were asking us. You said, is there anything different about Peter and John? And you basically answered it with Matthew chapter 17. And in my mind, I was thinking they had a stronger belief than we have and it's been kind of indoctrinated in our mind to to leave the works of faith and go to the works of performance and you know um i believe that this is the issue with the church today versus the church of the first century we we, we see the the works of the performance that the disciples and the first century christians and how they were living, but we forget that, you know, an apple tree is not an apple tree because you see the fruit. It's an apple tree because of what it is on the inside. And if it's not an apple tree on the inside, then it can't bear any fruit. So if, we, if we're we fighting the wrong fight, we have to fight the fight of faith. And, th and these are the only works of righteousness that God's children are to be concerned with is is the works of faith. God's not going to have faith for us. He, he tells us to to exercise it because he's already dealt to each one of us the measure of faith. And when the Amen. son of man comes, as he says, shall he find faith on the earth? So I just wanted to say that. Appreciate it. Thank you. And I agree that they had more faith, you say, and, and, I, and I, I can tell you why. Because they had a greater experience. They were with him, see? Um, that which we are telling you about is that which our eyes have seen and our hands have handled of the word of life. That's John's testimony. Because they, this is the truth. This is, they were with him and they understood clearly. That's why I'm telling you. I talk about circumstantial evidence. It's the truth. You look at how they, they reacted, how they dealt with situations. You go to the, to, to the New Testament. You go to, from Acts onward and you see how these things were done. Because these men understood from God, from Christ, how 
faith is demonstrated, how things are dealt with. Um, in 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 uh, once they were with him, they saw how he dealt with them, right? And they did the very same thing. How did he pray? They prayed the same way. How 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 did he how did he heal the sick, cleanse the leper, give sight to the blind? I mean, how did he do it? He did it by his words. He said he just spoke to it. He said, "Go, yeah, be healed." He said. Eyes be open, he said. I mean, he, he did all of this right before them. And they saw it. And did they do differently? No, 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 no. They did just what he did. And we have the record in the book of Acts. I see, Wayne, I see your hand raised. Um, go ahead, a quick one, and I'm going to just wrap it up with an opinion. I, I just want to say, you know, that um, when we talk about faith, it's sometimes it's seen like an effort in your mind that you try to express. But, but mm. based on the verses that you read, there's a, there's a relationship with the individual that strengthens the faith. Hear what I said. Such as we have, we give to you. Mm-hmm. That's relationship. Yeah. Every time they, they, they did something about healing, it's because of the relationship. Hear what you said again. The, the one that we have touched, the one that we have handled. It, could it be that our lacking experience of, of, of faith being evident is um is 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 a is a reflection of the relationship not really being there that love in the relationship is not really exist in existence hence the the, the missing um effect of our results of fate the, definitely the, most definitely brother Wayne. i mean and, and that's that's kind of what i'm i'm, I'm, I'm trying to bring across brothers i'm trying to bring across something to us that it is not god i'm telling you it is not god it is not god holding back because it's not the latter rain it's not god that is doing anything he gets the blame and we we, we blame him and we and we're offended with him it's not god it is us because we have not understood the truth as to what god did for us in christ jesus we just think that all that God did was to, was to put cross down Christ in the cross, and once He died, that was it. No, it was far more. That was just the beginning. That was just the beginning. But when 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 the when the angel said to John in Revelation that now is come salvation and strength and and the kingdom of God and the power of His Christ, there was something that we have missed in all of that. Once Christ went back and came, when Christ went back and the coronation according um, to to Psalms 27, um, and he came back in, at Pentecost, the power of God came back on earth. The reality of the kingdom came back on earth. But the devil has done a masterful thing. He has split up Christianity into denominations and, and had all these different teachings. From one book, 33,000 different denominations that are all saying we are the truth. And what do we have? We have a mess and people's minds are messed up. And when you, when you go and try to re- relate to people, you can't reach them. Because they have already been indoctrinated. They have already been hypnotized by the systems of the world. And so Christ says something is, has to happen. And I'm just going to make an appeal and we just close it off here, right? So, brothers and sisters, I, I, I want to speak to all of you prior warriors out there. And, and Sister Anita, great woman of God and the great men of God that are there, you know yourselves. It has been given to us to change the world. I am convicted of this. It has been given to us to change the world. But the weapons we have, the only weapon we have is the weapon of prayer and the weapon of demonstration. Right? That's the weapon we have, the weapon of prayer. Don't think that what I'm talking about is not prayer. That's prayer. James uh-huh. says that, that Elijah prayed earnestly. Like we go on our knees and say, God, please. No, no, no. The weapon we've been given is the weapon of prayer. Speaking and releasing what is in us. It's time we learn to do it. And we need to start exercising it. Maybe you could start at home. Maybe you could start beating back the evil forces that are going to distress you and bring all of these different things upon you. Start there because you have the authority. Look, my past, if, if, if in my past experiences, um, you know, if I've learned anything from my past, if I've learned anything at all from my past, it is one thing. It is this. In all, I mean, I mean, even as a Christian, the things that I've learned from my failure in, 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 in not seeing certain things, because when I go to pray for the sick, they end up dying. If there's one thing I've learned, it is this. Never back down. Never give up. Never allow what your eyes are seeing to change what the Word of God says. Because it's impossible for God to fail. It's impossible for His promise to fail. The word is clear. Nothing 
What's the word? Nothing shall be impossible unto you. Stand in faith. Stand in the word. Stand in Jesus. And never use the word failure again. Yeah. Ever. Because we are the change. You are the change. I am the change. Look, my favorite verse. Uh, we, we, we just close with that. Romans 8 and verse 19. It's my favorite verse. You write my name beside it. It's the truth. Um, just, uh, brother, brother, just go ahead and mute it. Uh, just, mute, just mute for me until we're done here. And I'll acknowledge you there. All right. So, so Romans 8 19. You know what the verse says. That the earnest expectation of the earnest expectation of the creation waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. Hallelujah! The earnest expectation. You don't want the loving desire of the world. You look at the world and we curse the world and we curse the guys with drugs and we curse these people. No, they need a light to be lit in their midst. Don't curse darkness. Light a candle. He says the earnest expectation of the creation waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. That's it. I'm equipping you to be who you are. I'm equipping you to stand on the word of God. I'm equipping you to stand on the word and speak the word. I'm equipping you so that you understand this is who you are. This is who you have been made to be in Christ Jesus. You have been made to be the light of the world. And that is, that, that's what it's all, this is all about. It's equipping you. I'm telling you, if all you're listening for is a good sermon, if all you're listening for, and, and some people, oh, he shouts too much. He makes you, no, 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 no. Forget all of that. Get to the core of what is being said. We need to be what he has created us to be, recreated us to be in Christ Jesus. How are we going to be that? How are we going, how are we going to see it? How are we going to declare it? How are we going to pro, uh, promote it? If we don't have it, Peter and John knew. They knew they had it. And they said, look, what we have, we're going to give you. And in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And he did. He did. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to share that song again with you and pray that you will listen more, more keenly to the words.
the authority of God in me above. What I confess, I possess. What I confess, I possess. My words are the coins in the kingdom of fame. What I confess, I possess. My words are the coins in the kingdom of fame. What I confess, I possess. So that's the truth. And uh, I, brothers and sisters, I really hope that the thoughts that I was able to share today, that you were able to understand, that you were able to understand and to recognize that God has given us, he, he, Paul says that we have been made to be more than conquerors through him that loved us. If we are more than conquerors, nothing is supposed to conquer you. You are you are greater than a conqueror. No, there is no there is no name in history. No Alexander the Great. No name in history. No 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 um, General Patton. None of these men's names should go above your name because Paul says you and I we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. Let's stand on that word of God and not back down any way shape or form let's stand in the word of god let's resist the devil and he will flee from us we're in a spiritual war it's the truth we're in a spiritual war so let's use the weapons we have and let's see the enemy jesus says that he he has sat down at the right hand of the father and he's expecting that's what the word says he's expecting what's he doing he's expecting what does the word mean he's waiting what is he waiting for the word said he's waiting to see his enemies be made his footstool now who's going to do that you and i we're going to do it you know why because our bodies are his temple christ and his father is alive they're living in us it's time we demonstrate it to the world let's pray